Hi guys, welcome to another guest episode of Chalchitra Talks. Today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Devashish Makija. Devashish is a filmmaker and he has made films like Ajji and Bhosle. He has made many amazing short films bhi hai, like Tandav, Agli Bar, Elaichi. And uh, Devashish has also been a very important part of my life since I moved to Bombay. He is one of those few people who has been there since the beginning. In fact, Devashish has a film community whose name is Abobo. I am also a part of that. So I spoke to Devashish a few days back and we took a lot of recommendations from him not just movies but books poetry graphic novels artists bahut shandar recommendations diye devashish ne so let's jump right inside the conversation i had with devashish makija so hi devashish how how are you thank you so much for doing this for us you do know that i am very shy about doing this <laughs> we- <laughs> डिफरेंट सेंसरशिप एंड you wouldn't get images and videos that freely back then about 50 60s so a lot of artists would draw these underground cult comics that were sex comics and when i say sex comics it's not the regular kind of pornography that normal people in other countries consume this was like slightly depraved it was a uh, hostage porn for example where you keep someone hostage for many years so it was disturbing shit and a lot of japanese society wouldn't talk about it openly but these comics were consumed by the millions enter this guy in this particular uh, you know medium of japanese manga and he starts telling political stories he doesn't even go down that road of forget sex but and no entertainment he starts telling stories of all these uh, people who were survivors of the hiroshima nagasaki blasts and in short stories so like this book the pushman and other stories has about 13 or 14 stories which are not more than 15 20 pages each and they're mostly silent his characters don't speak much and he's he found idioms you wouldn't find in comics or art of other countries idioms come from japanese society where you know you can't speak openly like the the sex manga you can't speak openly but everyone's got these very repressed emotions and uh, you know opinions on things that they can't voice so a lot of society couldn't voice their opinion on what happened with the hiroshima nagasaki blasts so he sort of became that spokesperson for that entire generation in short comics so the the power in this images has been very inspiring because he doesn't rely on dialogue he doesn't rely on voice over which a lot of american comics do he's mm. just non verbal silent black and white manga imagery and every short story leaves you shifted and fucked like i i take a day to recover from his work when i revisited when was the first time you read it 2006 man oh <laughs> yeah, so i've been he's been with me for 15 years how nice uh aage move karte what are the other recommendations so i'm a tintinophile so there was this book called tintin and the secret of literature okay. which uh, in a very interesting non comic way like this guy who wrote it tom mccarthy he is uh, also a psychiatrist Okay. Uh, or a psych uh, uh, a psychologist. He's in the. He works with the mind. So he's uh, deconstructed Tintin at a very uh, psychiatric uh, level. You know what might have been going through Herge's mind. You know, in a Freudian, in a Jungian way, when he came up with uh, the character of Bianca Castiglione or the things that Haddock does. So this deconstruction of Tintin. <laughs> blew my mind because i thought i knew tintin until i read this book it's not a very well known book but i've revisited it three four times in the last 10 years and it's also shaped a lot of storytelling decisions that i made wow or not on the basis of the way i had a relationship with tintin and how that relationship changed when this guy deconstructed tintin it's like an analysis also like would it be possible for you to read any excerpt from it aise koi ek more than an excerpt there is one idea in it that yeah. uh, i have sort of explored over the last decade or so so if you see tintin the way he's drawn his face is an oval yeah this guy has deconstructed that oval face as a cipher as a zero because tintin is the only character in tintin comics who is not emotional 
like he doesn't get scared he doesn't get angry he doesn't get moved he doesn't get passionately charged all the other characters from the thompson thompson to calculus to hadock to castafiore they have their emotional churn they have their ups they have their downs they get you know aggravated by situations tintin never does he has a straight line graph mm. and the graph goes nowhere it just keeps going straight right to the comics so that cipher that zero at the heart of a passionate story is a psychological motif that this guy caught so he said there must have been a reason that hurge gave tintin an oval face and so when you place a character who is emotionless at the heart of an investigative kind of story you as a reader are held you are anchored by this cipher because you know that this thing is dislogical he is not going to move he is going to be the same every time you revisit him that gives you a 50 year relationship to the comics which is also at the heart of the web series hmm. we didn't have web series or the kind of tv series that spawned web series till 20 years ago yeah because that motif of having that one anchor at the heart of a series yeah. whether it's a media or a team of people or one individual comes from these comics wow. before comics that idea of a series of you know exploring a character over many many years over many many stories but the character is more or less the same yeah because you coming back for the familiarity was not there in the audio visual medium hmm. it was there in comics okay so do you have more uh, graphic novel or book recommendations yes so now this brings me to uh, america and america's uh, graphic novels and graphic novel series a long time back america and comics departed from the superhero and went into neo realism okay so this series cal it's a 65 70 comic series collected in like 10 or 11 volumes like this one it's the story of a of a red indian guy who uh, third or fourth generation red indian who's who's now a cia operative and is sent into the red indian community to sort of bust a drug racket okay and how he has this this complicated relationship with his own roots but now he's working for white man america trying to bust the drug racket that people of his kind are you know operating hmm. and he starts realizing that what choice do the red indians have hmm. if you are marginalized and you're placed at the periphery of what you know as normal you start doing things to survive and those things might be seen as illegal and you know a lot of my ideas in my stories the what the adivasi goes to what the dalit goes to what women in a certain low lower milieu strata go to they come from these stories okay so it's the first time that in a major so dc vertigo published this and in a major comic series i saw these motifs being uh, you know explored so this particular i'm i'm shocked that this hasn't been made into a web series yet the storytelling in some of these comic series is unbelievable right next one please this is a book of poetry it's one of the three or four books that i came to bombay with it's a collection of the best indian poets in english around that time when mm-hmm. that time i mean 20 22 years ago i think when you come to bombay and you come for the first yeah. time but you come to stay yeah you know, it sort of fucks your mind in ways you <laughs> just me the alienation that you feel like you know do i belong here what Absolutely. part of bombay do i fit into yeah how do i find a long term relationship with bombay what am i going to give bombay what is bombay going to give me so that's why this book is called reasons of belonging and they were poems about dislocation of a certain kind and my first two three years in bombay and this i'm talking about 2002 3 4 when the industry as you know it now didn't exist it was still the govinda era was finishing there was the sporadic ramgopal varma and vishal bharadwaj had not made his makbool yet So filmmakers like me, I didn't even know if I was a filmmaker. We didn't know what we were coming to Bombay for. Hmm. So it was a shock coming to the industry and trying to tell stories that you think you want to tell. Hmm. Every night I wanted to slit my throat or jump into the sea or fucking go back where I came from. This book kept me going. Wow. There's like a hundred, hundred and twenty poems here that I must have read a hundred, hundred twenty times each. अभी भी आप रिविजिट करते हो सर आई हैव अ पोएम दैट आई कैन रीड फॉर यू प्लीज 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 वन ऑफ माय फेवरेट पोएम अ पोएट एक्चुअली फ्रॉम दैट टाइम यूज्ड टू बी द एडिटर ऑफ टीओआई कॉल्ड सीपी सुरेंद्र एंड अ लॉट ऑफ हिज मोटिव्स आर यू नो डिसलोकेशन डिप्रेशन एंड लोनलीनेस दिस वन पोएम एक्सप्लोर्स ऑल ऑफ देम इट्स अ वेरी शॉर्ट पोएम बट हार्ट ब्रेकिंग इट्स कॉल्ड रिटर्न टुडे आई शेव द एयर माय मिरर आई बेथ्ड इन द रिवर the falls my shower 
I listen to music, the wild grass, my violin. Blessed trees for fruit, pure as fire. Pull the sky over my face, spoke to the stars, and slept on sand, the breeze, my song. The moon was easy, moving through the branches of my bones. Tomorrow at first light, I'll cut my wrist and watch a perfect sun set. You know, you read poets like this and you, you just feel a little solace ki yaar, tum akele nahi ho. Hmm. Everyone who you respect has been down these roads, yeah. has, has faced these same things and survived it. Yeah. So that solace is what this book gave me. Yeah. My last recommendation is, uh, is the marriage of literature and the graphic medium. So we know a lot of filmmakers who have adapted literature from Kubrick to Ray. And some of the finest films have been adaptations of literature. Yeah. But some of the finest graphic novels, like the finest graphic work, have also been adaptations of literature, which are actually impossible to adapt as films. There's an, uh, a writer called Paul Auster. Okay. And he wrote a trilogy on New York. His first book was called City of Glass. And there was an artist called David Mazzucchelli who drew Batman Year One that Frank Miller wrote that has been the Bible on which Christopher Nolan uh, you know, founded his Batman to be. So David Mazzucchelli uh, adapted City of Glass into a graphic novel. Now City of Glass is uh, an existential, slightly depressive, uh, you know, exploration of New York through the eyes of a really pathetic uh, detective. Hmm. He's not good at his job and he's conflicted with, you know, how he feels about what he does, the city he lives in, life itself, an existential sort of exploration. Now there's one uh, passage in City of Glass that sort of goes from, you know, the real macro to the real micro. It goes from the city and the city, uh, the way the writer describes the city, it almost becomes like an internal landscape of this protagonist. Hmm. And everything is feeling, he sort of metaphorizes in the city. Now look at the way this guy does it. He goes from the city goes more and more micro, more and more micro, more and more micro till he says it's like a maze that he can't, uh, you know, navigate and it becomes his fingerprint. And over one page, he tells you that the city and his inner identity are inextricable hmm. without any word. Wow. So this is something that this medium can do. You can't do that in a film. So the graphic medium I found to be one of the most powerful mediums that I have uh, experience even more than cinema and I've tried to dabble in it but India doesn't really have a history this is a European uh, you know American West uh, medium they come from those ideas and those philosophies so I have, I'm actually exploring cinema because I I couldn't explore the graphic novel medium kafi, kafi hai. let's come to cinema after music now so first <laughs> let's talk about music what's your relation with music in general how important is music for you as an artist? More than it being important for me as an artist or even for my cinema, like a lot of writers, they listen to music when they write yeah. or they use music to help them find the tone and the mood for their films. Yeah. I don't listen to music at all because music is so all consuming for me that I can't think of the other departments when I get consumed by music. So for the longest time in school and college growing up, I was a musician. I had a band. Oh. All I wanted to do with my life what was the name of your band? It was called The Big Liars. L-Y-R-E-S. Oh, okay. One of liars. Because that's what we do as youngsters. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I only wanted to do music. So my in point into art is music. Everything else came later. So uh, I that, that's my relation to music, man. It's everything for me. So now, in fact, I keep it at an arm's distance because when I get a little immersed in music, I can't do anything else. I'd like give up cinema in a heartbeat if I could have my music career back. But too many years have passed and I didn't follow through. And like what, like, uh, I'm so sorry, like, I was band ke baare mein thoda aur batao, like, uh, kitte log the, like, ye story kaafi interesting hai. And what exactly did you do in the band? I was a lead singer. Okay. The part lyric writer. We did all the things that Calcutta bands do. Uh, and also the lineup changed. Like, there was a different lineup in school than in college. Uh, the uh, drummer and keyboardist, the guy called Amit Ray, he sort of 
formed a band and uh, he he brought us together so we were together for 3 4 years i mean we did rock like all calcutta bands do but i think what set us apart was that all the band members the drummer the keyboardist the bassist the lead guitarist everyone was a singer hmm we'd all sing in the calcutta choir as well hmm so uh, so i like i was a tenor in the calcutta choir okay so when we do the first two, if you did a set of six songs the first three songs would be electric and you know it would be a band sound and then fourth song we'd surprise the audience the keyboardist would put his keyboard aside the drummer would put his sticks down the guitarist would take the guitars off five mics would appear and we do a cappella ah uh. <laughs> so we do five part five part harmonies and we do a cappella songs we do beach boys we do moody blues we do the softer rock and the harmony songs okay so uh, music ki recommendations like aap dena chahe so where do we start from so my favorite uh, genre now in the last few years i mean we used to listen to a lot of jazz back in calcutta but uh, when i came to bombay what films did for me it opened me up to sub genres of music that i didn't know existed like through the soundtracks of uh, jaws have you heard the soundtrack of jaws it's alex vetkini but yeah it's an acid jazz yeah. disco soundtrack you have a horror film with a shark and it has an acid jazz disco soundtrack okay so i started discovering acid jazz and i got further and further into it and like there's an album by miles davis one of his least popular albums it's most experimental called bitches brew and there's just like four 30 35 28 minute tracks where he and his session when i say sessions musician he's got herbie hancock hmm. like the biggest session musicians of the time just experimenting with dark sounds hmm. it almost sounds like the sound of satan you know wow. so it goes into these dark uh, terrains that otherwise jazz uh, would never do you know like the big band jazz swing jazz would never go dark yeah so those sounds and those motifs i'm very big on uh, acid jazz acid jazz is probably my favorite genre of music wow there are some artists lesser known here but uh, gods in the us especially in the original soundtrack bgm space deodato in fact did uh, you heard the 2001 a space odyssey ka piece hmm. dust track zarathustra mm-hmm. so he's done a disco version a 14 oh. minute disco version of dust track zarathustra and it's unlike anything you'd ever hear it still has that scale but you can fucking dance to it <laughs> you believe so so that space where it's dance music yet not yet it's cinematic it evokes all kinds of imagery so that's uh, one of my favorites again when i came to bombay poetry was solace another man whose voice was a uh, solace for me like the first few years in a city like bombay trying to do the things we do as artists you don't forget next month's rent you don't know where tomorrow's meal is going to come from sometimes hmm. so that this is one man his voice just kept me from you know self destructing because his voice for me was the voice of uh, breath just the voice of being alive is a man called malik arjun mansoor okay and he's one of my favorite classical singers and he did for me i don't know he speaks to me in a way that no other singer ever did and especially these two tracks that uh, he did two rags a morning rag and an afternoon rag i think shuddha nat and bhim palasi so the way he sings shuddha nat and the way he sings bhim palasi you'll find them both on youtube in fact not his best recordings but i have multiple recordings of those two tracks i used to hear him on loop there was a time working on black friday i had chicken pox and i never had chicken pox as a child so i thought fuck chicken pox i'm 24 i have chicken pox i think i'm going to die khane ko nahi hai dawai ke paise nahi hai aur mujhe chicken pox ho gaya this man i heard bhim palasi on loop for 3 days got me out of chicken pox <laughs> you know art art can do that if you allow it to how nice are there any other uh, music recommendations also is this your favorite question everything i'm giving you other other are you you're very greedy man nahi kyunki aap pause itna lamba le lete na to like i'm like ki okay like do do i queue you in always 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 queue okay i was your job in abobo also no yeah koi sawal nahi puch raha hai to munja le ek sawal puch le yaar so there's this is uh, a album what seems like a conventional jazz album but uh, was a game changer of its time he's a musician called stan getz and the album was called focus although he was a big band jazz musician this album has sounds that go into slightly experimental acid territory and 
he's this album is considered by some as the one of the roots of the acid jazz kind of exploration there are eight tracks on this album and every time i've gotten stuck trying to write a script or trying to see a film i just play this album from any point and he just unlocks something visually so i strongly recommend this album to all any and all filmmakers focus than gets koi hamare local artist indian artist aur bataiye jinka aapko music pasand hai in fact my favorite uh, background musician background scorist in india is also the one i work with i'm very fortunate to have had him do the music of achi and bosle mangesh dakade i discovered his work uh, on these two films vihir and balu films by umesh kulkarni the music in vihir in fact when we get to movie recommendations vihir is my top indian movie recco the music in that film is uh, unlike anything i've heard in india it's so brilliant that i thought an indian couldn't have done it i mean we have such low opinions of ourselves <laughs> i thought umesh got someone from fucking europe to do the music and then i find out is a man called mangesh dakade who lives in bombay lives in yari road and this is the only time i have hunted someone down as a fanboy Wow. just to tell him how much i love his work and dar dar ke maine pucha can i work with you and he's like bro i'm looking for work wow and now we've had a partnership that straddles three films and more now let's move to um, movies i can start with vihir i have uh, never seen a film like vihir not just like generally when we say that we've never seen a film like this coming out of india we always add that disclaimer coming india out says of india vihir. but ha abroad to dekhi hogi like court for example is a great film but it's not very unlike such films that have been made in europe in the art house movement earlier you know not much spoken and long takes so it's uh, so there are great films because they are they're great because india hasn't hit those highs until that film came along but we here is a film that's great by world standards that man umesh kulkarni has taken an indian motif of an indian joint family in a small in small town maharashtra and he's only explored philosophical ideas he the film from the beginning departs from you know just human relationships and human banter and neo realism the kind of things that we obsess over in our films and he just goes straight into philo- philosophy philosophy in symbolism philosophy in subtext philosophy in metaphors we here means a well and the number of meanings that that idea of a well has in that film is mind boggling it's not just one sim, you know symbol symbolistic metaphor it's many metaphors it changes meaning with every character every character has a different relationship with the metaphoric idea of a well and the way the music you know ex- explores those same motifs i had never seen a film like vihir mm-hmm. vihir in fact reinstilled faith in indian audiences for me that you know i might be able to explore and maybe i'll have people here allow me to do that although i was wrong i never got a chance to do the things i wanted to do and vihir was slammed by indian audiences they like kya bakwas banayi hai theek se release nahi hui ek award nahi mila us film ko gaya hui when did this come out this came out in 2008 or 9 okay this was the last film released by amitabh bachchan corporation limited tbc oh because around that time all these companies used to do regional cinema as a token thing on the side hmm. and they released it but they didn't do anything for it nobody came to watch it to ye abhi koi kahin dekhna chahe to kahan milenge bahut mushkil hai main director se kai baar dcp ya dvd mang chuka hu uske i wanted to do screenings of the film it's really hard to locate because abcl apparently owns it and ah. i don't think they have archived it too well there is a very low resolution mp4 that i found online once that uh, subhish kamat had found and put up to wahi hai mere paas bahut hi low resolution hai but the films hard to find okay moving on the film that actually brought me to bombay <clears throat> i never knew i'll say this because uh, i was not a film buff in bombay uh, in calcutta i didn't grow up on cinema i never gone to a film festival the only thing i understood of cinema was mithun chakravarti films that released when i was a kid <laughs> and it was just disco dancer and kasam paida karne wali ki that's all i was surrounded by as a yeah. child so i wasn't excited about being that kind of artist then in 1998 i was in second year college and uh, i don't know why but 15 of us went to watch a film and there were there is two theaters they both shut down now which are side by side in calcutta there's new empire and lighthouse and uh, if two hollywood films release in a week one goes to new empire one goes to lighthouse 
New Empire was showing saving private land. Lighthouse was showing the thin red line. And in the 15 of us, 14 went to watch Saving Private Ryan. I don't know why I went to watch the Saving Red Line. And it, it just changed me. I'm like, ye kya hai? America se ye nikla. Although after that, I have uh, gotten a little tired of Terence Malik and him repeating those same motifs and voiceovers in all his films. But Thin Red Line holds a very, very special place for me because somewhere... Uh, I consider it, and I think a lot of people do, his only proper narrative film. Hmm. Because it, it's a dramatic narrative and it has its beats, it has its three-act structure, it has its character graph, which even Tree of Life doesn't have. And within that, he's doing his thing, nice. his meditative, philosophical thing. And I didn't know that you could tell a story like this or in any other way other than the way Spielberg, the Spielbergs of America do. And that got me thinking that if I want to be a storyteller, maybe I can consider this medium. So Thin Red Line has haunted me, stayed with me, I've gone back to it uh, many times. And then I recently got to know that uh, apparently Adrian Brody was the lead in Thin Red Line. Okay. The film got greenlit by a studio because Adrian Brody said yes. They shot for two months with Adrian Brody and he's nowhere in the film. <laughs> He got his whole track got left out on the cutting table. That's crazy, you know. To have the con yeah. forget the freedom. Okay. The freedom also doesn't come without a price, even in Hollywood. Yeah. Imagine the 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 courage and the artistic uh, strength to be able to do that. Yeah. That I'm an artist, I'm discovering my film. Even a star doesn't get in the way of that. Mm. I'm sorry I had to leave Adrian Brody out because the film became a different creature on Eddie. I still haven't reached that place, but I wish I do something. Uh, maybe the next question for you. Like, like, do you think you can do something like that? See, I can do that in my short films, which is why I'm pushing myself to reach a place with my shorts where I'm producing myself. Hmm. Like I told you about the two shorts that I produced this year, yeah. earlier this year, and we finished editing them. One is ready, one is still in post. The kind of freedom I've given myself because nobody else in this town or this country will give me that freedom. Yeah. Is the kind of freedom I think Terence Malik somehow manages to get himself in features i don't think in this lifetime in this country i'll manage that okay but with shorts i'm hoping to stay there can we also i know we'll talk about movies but as a like one or two up short film recommendations we then i knew i said the word shorts i knew you last me that <laughs> so i don't have too many things. like we used to <laughs> show <laughs> Indian shorts, no, and huh. I'm sorry, I'm Indian, I'm proud to be Indian, I want to make Indian films all my life, but I know that we are wanting in many, uh, you know, capacities. We are not the best in the world, and we have a long way to go. Hmm. We need to become very radical, like Iran, hmm. for a new kind of idiom to emerge that will be purely Indian. We are nowhere close to that. Ek banda Maharashtra mein, ek banda Kerala mein, ek banda Assam mein koshish kar raha but us ek movement nahi hoga, no? hmm. 10, 15 filmmakers like in Iran in the late 80s have to do it at the same time for there to be a voice for a particular country's cinema. Even in Korea in the 80s and 90s, a bunch of them were doing it simultaneously. Here we are very far from that. So I, I just to call a spade a spade, I think Indian cinema, Indian cinema, if I speak about specific Indian filmmakers and specific films, yes, I can name 10 films that are fantastic, but Indian cinema broadly, I can't think of any film that I'd recommend. At least in the in, short space. Haan, main push tha. Okay. In fact, a film hai jo humne Abubo mein do bar dikhai, which I really like, Counterfeit Kunku. Oh, yeah. Sen Gupta. We see films from India, including my own, where you know there might be passion and you know very strong politics, but then it's a little low on craft. Yeah. Or then you really nail the craft, but then you're so caught up in the craft that what you're saying is a little oh, lost, ho gaya, thoda weak. Ho gaya. Yeah. Counterfeit yeah. Kunku was the first shot from India I saw where craft and politics and what she was trying to say were Absolutely. all bullseye. It is so tight on all parameters. So, a film, hai, I mean, a filmmaker that almost everybody today will name as one of their greats. But. Uh, this was a film that moved me in very strange ways, even before he became a Hollywood power center. In Aritu, I'm talking about Beautiful. Mm. In his career graph, it's his only flop. It's That's a flop. It. It's a flop. 
it's a flop because it was an american production it released in america properly bona fide but it's a spanish film it's so the one with javier bardem right javier bardem yeah. and also a lot of critics like including roger ebert i think they called it a little confused they didn't know what the film was is it about this one man's journey is it about this this comment on the afterlife hmm. is it about the migrant and how a migrant can't survive a big city is it about barcelona is it about his bipolar wife they couldn't decide what the film was they didn't have one emotional anchor to hold on to which all of other inarithu films have do you also agree that was the problem in the movie it's, it's one of my favorite films it's my top 3 films of all time so when i read the critics after i unabashedly loved the film i was shocked i'm like uh, are you, why are you seeking this from this film because this film is trying to be 40 things at one time and i had never seen so many things a film trying to be so many things at one time somewhere i saw a subtextual motif to the film trying to be so many things because his wife is exploring a medical bipolarity somewhere with javier bardem's character uxbal i'm seeing a certain kind of metaphysical bipolarity where he can talk to the afterlife yet he's trying to navigate the current life and he knows he's dying hmm. he has a certain kind of cancer so he knows he's he's already in that middle state between being alive and knowing that he's going to be dead and he's talking to people who are dead so there's bipolarity at so many levels that i thought the film was an exploration of the bipolarity that uh, you know the critics are accusing it of so i found that very rewarding in that film wow. it just again it unlocked a certain you know preconceived notion you have of cinema i had seen amores peros i had seen babel i had seen 21 grams and in the title love is a bitch or in the title babel learned the title 21 grams is a metaphor that the whole film sort of is built around hmm. but in beautiful there is no metaphor at the heart of it hmm. it's just a misspelled word beautiful yeah what is trying to tell you i think is that it doesn't matter it's about all these things like all our lives are our lives are not about any one thing yeah we are all these amalgamations of so many things so beautiful is a film that i actually show my teams i showed everybody who worked on bosley was shown beautiful wow more than once just to unlock preconceived notions that don't look for the journey of one old man in bosley don't look for it to be just a political film don't look for it to be a relationship between an old man and a young woman lunchbox did that journey of an old man several films have done that a political film on the marathi and the outsider several films have done that i was trying to make a film that was about many things hmm. and beautiful, because beautiful was made it gave me the courage to see if i could make a film about many things yet many critics who have even liked bosley have criticized it for that only like first half mein kuch aur hai second half mein kuch aur ho jata hai kabhi slow hai to kabhi pace pick up kar jati hai kabhi single character ki journey hai to kabhi itne sare characters aate hain to chol ki kahani ho jati hai so they are they ask me which film is it i'm like no it's all films it's all these films hmm. just like beautiful words right my last recommendation is again a film that i've so the films i'm recommending really i have a lot of favorites yes i don't watch too many films either because i uh, i'm a bit of a geek and i'm not a film watcher of the kind that you are you have a lot of respect for the medium i i don't mean to disrespect the medium but i don't enjoy the medium that much to mai itna research karta hu ki mai wikipedia bhi padh leta hu i try and remember the story when i go into the film so i'm not watching it for story i'm watching it just to take away things as a filmmaker hmm i watch films academically and i enjoy it when people tell me ki yaar leave your brain at home and watch it in audio i don't want to i don't enjoy that yeah i'd rather read a graphic novel yeah. or listen to it yeah i want to watch it academically that is those are my most satisfying experiences so then when a film sticks it sticks for life then i'll go back to thin red line and beautiful and vihir 20 times because academically they have blown my mind got it so my last recommendation is a film by julio medem called sex and lucia so julio medem is a spanish filmmaker that not many people in this part of the world have heard of and sex and lucia is in fact his third film and uh, again me coming from being a poet poet and uh, mostly a prose writer and then trying to find my uh trying to find a way to express myself in an audio visual medium so uh taking a step back and just try and try and maybe try and understand also while i'm talking why i really like sex in lucia so you know when you come to bombay or even hollywood this you won't find this in europe 
you are told that you know there is an entity called the writer there is an entity called the filmmaker so you have to first inhabit the 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 shoes of a writer separately and then the shoes of a filmmaker separately so the writer word i think is a misnomer in film because when you're writing you don't really need to have a mastery of language you need to only understand cinema language like in europe on a godard film you'll never find a script or a screenplay credit you find a credit called scenario and when you see a scenario which is although it's on paper just look for a jean luc godard scenario get your hands on it it's scribbles it's notes it's one dialogue two dialogues it's a little diagram with you know some uh, short descriptions it's really the film on paper it's a road map what hollywood did was in the studio hollywood uh, era like hitchcock used to make on a good day he used to make four to six films a year now he can't sit down and create a scenario from scratch for each film right like mm. kubrick made what 13 films in a career spanning 60 years and your hitchcock was banging out four films a year so the studio system forced you to specialize your jobs mm. so hitchcock would hire writers now who are those writers most of them are novelists Somerset Maugham and writers like him have written Hitchcock films. Mm. So he'd get them into a room, he'd make them write, and then he'd take that text and he'd break it down as he's shooting. So what that gave rise to was this very wrong notion of someone having to be able to write to be able to write a screenplay. So as a writer, because I was essentially a writer, I write poetry, so I tend to enjoy turns of phrase. I tend to enjoy language. But when I'm writing a film on paper that I'm going to shoot. that became a test for me that if i start enjoying the language i will forget that i'm trying to make a film and yeah. i'll put too much on paper i will not leave room for imagery and and audio yeah so i uh, when i used to stumble upon films that were about writers i used to pay close attention that how is this filmmaker bringing a writer's character to life so sex and lucia is about a novelist and it's about a novelist and half the film you're seeing him typing on a you know an old pc you know that black screen with almost coding kind of text very uncinematic and it's one of the most cinematic films i've seen so when you uh, so i read a lot about how julio medem sort of externalized the you know workings of a writer so you know what he did he first wrote a screenplay at the heart of which was this novel that this novelist was writing then julio medem wrote the novel oh and he took the motifs from the novel and broke the character's journey in the screenplay down on the basis of the novel that he has written that julio has written on behalf of the character so there are motifs in the novel so with prose like with say gabriel garcia marquez there are a lot of uh, you know fantastical allegory allegorical motifs that you can't cinematize that you can't put in visuals because they are abstract hmm. so if a gabriel garcia marquez story ever becomes a film it will never be as powerful as a book like a murakami book becoming a film all those films have been either critically unacclaimed or flops because how do you bring those abstract ideas to audio visual you can't they're all playing in your subconscious true so this guy has played with subconscious ideas because in that film when you see sex and lucia the characters don't have arcs they don't finish so there is an idea at the heart of the novel that the novelist is writing it's about the story set on an island and the island apparently has a hole that runs through it mm -hmm. so there's a wind so there's a there's a geographical term for that wind tunnel so it's a floating island that wind tunnel keeps this island floating on the sea so it doesn't have to be anchored to the ocean uh, the ocean bed so he constructed the screenplay like a structure that has a hole between it so everything that is going somewhere loops back on itself and those loops never finish it's an exploratory story of three individuals and it goes back and forth not just in time but also in identity the characters this ca this novelist is thinking of are played by the same two women that he is in love with in his real world and their mothers and fathers become people that he meets but you're meeting them after he is meeting them after they have been played by the character actors who are playing them in the novel you know what i'm saying like you meet somebody in the real world then you imagine them as a character in the novel mm. in the film it's the reverse 
So it's almost like has he brought them to life? So who is telling the story? The filmmaker or the novelist within the film? Am I watching the novel or am I watching the story? The novel writer's story. The film doesn't answer any of these questions. Wow. And the film, when you watch it, is so. It's it's a lustful film. It's all about love. There's a lot of a gratuitous nudity, and therefore it got banned in a lot of countries. And it's beautiful nudity. It's about touch. It's about the skin. It's about sand. It's about water. It's about the moon. It's about moonlight. It's about sex. It's about all those things. Yet it's abstract. It doesn't get pinned down to the flesh the way a Pedro Almodovar film does. Almodovar says it's flesh and it stays at flesh. Hmm. Beautifully, yes. But I'm not a very big Almodovar fan. Okay, now the. You have told me that was interesting. Jo, we have said earlier, Ani, you want to talk about a few artists in specific. So one of my uh, all-time uh, favorite artists, and he sort of also shaped the. I keep going back to my work just because. Every time I enjoy an artist or their work, hmm. it, it shapes me as an artist. So my in point really is my art yeah. to every artist or filmmaker or musician that I talk about. Yeah. I forgive me for sounding self-obsessed, but it's really that's my access point. Yeah. You know, I don't want to talk about them without talking about how they shaped my art. Yeah. So the brokenness of my characters, you know, like even the say the color palette in a ghost movie, there is a lot of uh, uh, earthy. browns but not in a very uh uh pretty palette kind of way in a very broken kuch toota hua hai wounded kind of way i'm very inspired by egon schiel okay he's an austrian artist who was a, a contemporary but a little younger than gustav klimt and if you see gustav klimt's work he does gorgeous looking men and women hmm. egon schiel being from the same you know milieu the same history the same country working almost at the same time is the complete antithesis like his characters are naked and they are broken and they are weeping from inside and they are bruised like if a man and woman like there's a piece called lovers the man and woman are in embrace but it's it's brown broken green and red bruises on their body it's almost like their love for each each other is going to kill them wow. and painfully So there's a lot of bruising. So he used to actually draw a lot of, uh, he used to sketch a lot of the prostitutes of that time in the, in the cheaper neighborhoods, you know. So a lot of the prostitutes, uh, in areas that uh, they can't command a high fee, are often back then because there weren't, there wasn't any kind of societal awareness for like today we are a gen slightly gender woke society. so we at least the prostitute knows somewhere that a man can't brutalize her and get away with it she can raise a hue and cry but 150 years ago they didn't know that they could do that they thought just by offering up their body for trade a man can get away with anything so a lot of the people going to the prostitutes who charged less in the ghetto areas would actually uh, you know leave them bruised and uh, bleeding sometimes like there'd be men who go to them just to urinate in their mouths pay them but they would think that you know we can do anything with you for a fee so this guy used to go and paint them and almost try and bring their soul to the surface so a lot of that brokenness comes from those broken women you know who are still trying to hold up a certain kind of strength in their faces because this is what they do for food on the table there's no walking away from it so i have been very inspired by that uh, that brokenness so when i have to uh, find a way to manifest a brokenness of a psyche in an ajji or a bhosle i just show my production designer and my cinematographers egon shields work i just make egon shield my my wallpaper and it just sort of internalizes and it gets externalized when you're making the film when i'm trying to heal myself i keep myself very far away from me ganj but he just pulls me into very broken spaces wow hmm another artist uh, that i in fact discovered uh, not very long ago is uh, an iranian uh, uh, political cartoonist mm-hmm. like we had our arke lakshman 
he's almost like a modern rk lakshman of iran he's a gentleman called mana nestani i'll share some of his work and he has a facebook page he's very active on instagram and uh, i don't know how to describe him but his work but you know like political cartooning is what it's just one panel right? like rk lakshman in one box uh, how much can you summarize into that one image about an entire politic like if say for example the bjp decides to erect a 500 meter statue of uh, you know somebody that is not just that act of the bjp that you are lampooning in a cartoon you're then lampooning that arrogant thought process that brought them to the point that they can use taxpayers money to build that statue True. and get away with it so in a one panel with just maybe one gag it's it's superhero levels of storytelling that i don't think i can do in this lifetime so i have always worshiped political cartoonists who can do all of that in one panel and mana niyastani is the finest i have seen in all the political cartoons i have seen in all my life and when i say i seen political cartoons i've seen a lot i've got two shelves of my book covered that are only anthologies of political cartoons wow. from all kinds of countries all over the world because that marriage of image and very little text and such big political commentary you only find in the political cartoon this guy we knows he is very aware that a i think he doesn't operate in iran if i'm not mistaken i'm not sure because in iran he'll get killed for the things he says so he knows that his audience resides actually outside of iran he's trying to get people outside of iran to understand and think about what's going wrong in iran so he almost doesn't use text his political cartoons are silent gags silent ideas with with no text even harder to do no in yeah. just one one image to tell me so much about a history of a situation and make it universal and my last recommendation of an artist again a, a modern uh, acquisition of mine is a, a japanese uh, illustrator but considered a fine artist because his illustrations are fine art he doesn't do it uh, for commercial value he does it for art is his nickname is munasi munasi so he is also very active on instagram and uh, i don't know how to describe him without showing you something so it's uh, so he is also working with the abstract but emotional you know what i was saying about say sex and lucia that the ideas of identity the ideas of uh, uh, you know how much you have to feel away before you get to the subconscious very uh, western philosoph- philosophy ideas of the self he manifests in his art with the same character inhabiting all his art like sitintin now that same character is there in 50 years of hergis story telling in munasi's art unlike an egon shield for example munasi is also over 100 artworks is probably i'm not sure maybe trying to tell you a story about this one guy because this guy inhabits all his art hmm. but each piece is a canvas of its own hmm. so that is also something i have not seen in too many artists that you create an iconography which is uh, that one character or that one set of characters that inhabit then all your art hmm. like the horses in mf husain's paintings hmm. you see a horse drawn a certain way you think mf husain hmm. you see today you see a horse painted in any way you like are mf husain to horse factory a horse reminds you of mf husain because he is appropriated that iconography of the horse so munasi did that you know for me he sort of made me think about how you can create a body of work that has one voice running through it maybe yet each piece stands alone so somewhere say for example uh, the characters in an ajji and the characters in a gosle and the characters in three of the other scripts i'm writing which are set in bombay have a lot of overlaps if you notice the villain in ajji and the villain in gosle have the same name they're both vilasrao bhavle hmm. but i choose to and they're both in white hmm. but i choose to uh, emphasize different things about the two of them because i'm trying to tell two different stories hmm. but there are overlaps to the universes that these characters inhabit hmm. almost like a graphic novel series like a sin city every sin city comic told a different story 
but the the second the secondary character in one story would become the primary character in some other story the universe in all the 2025 sin city comics is one but every story is a standalone story so i see that in the art of munasi and i've never seen that in an artist because he's not telling a story he's just making art how oh, nice so uh Are we like done with the recommendations? कोई और कहीं से भी is there anything that I might have missed that you would like to talk about? कोई एक ऐसी चीज रह गई हो जो शायद मैंने touch नहीं की, but you are like oh wait let's also talk about this. I always do this part जिससे कि याद आ जाए कुछ ऐसा है रह ना जाए. In fact, uh, शायद एक किताब है हाँ. which is also a uh, lot of people might have even spoken about it. You may have read it. Everyone knows about it. Uh, but this book. Uh, went a long way in answering a lot of my questions about cinema it's a book called conversations hmm. between the writer of the book english patient and the editor walter murch hmm. because walter murch also edited english patient yeah. and that's what i read and uh, walter murch is one of the finest minds in american yeah. cinema, world cinema in fact and although he was an editor and a sound editor his understanding of cinema transcends that yeah. like an apocalypse now That film is less Coppola and more Walter Murch hmm. because the man came back with what 400 plus hours of footage, yeah. and this man made that film out of it. And 400 hours of footage, of which a lot of them were staccato; they were not, they were not pieces that were adding up. So Walter Murch and Michael Ondaatje, when Michael Ondaatje sort of involved himself in the editing process of English Patient, just to see how his book is becoming a film. Murch and he found a lot of common ground. You know, on they spoke about uh, philosophers and writers and uh, thinkers that they both admired, and they found a lot of overlaps. And they start talking about the overlaps in the different forms of storytelling, the different different departments in the different forms of storytelling, and just life itself, and how a lot of us enters our art, mm. and how to make that channel to be able to. you know express our inner selves through our art like an editor for example in india uh, an editor a lot of editors that i know and i've spoken to they feel a little cheated as artists they feel like they're not able to leave their imprint on the films they uh, edit because the filmmaker is treated like god in the i'm talking about the artist in an artistic sense so you can recognize an anurag kashyap film by dint of his language but can you recognize a particular editor's film so walter murch talks about those ideas as well not just for filmmakers but for all artists and even an editor a cinematographer a production designer he's an artist and if you think about your art and work on you know sculpting that channel you can affect every piece of art that you make as well because as an editor if you're feeling artistic you don't want to give up on editing just because editing is not allowing you to be artistic Hmm. Want to find your voice, no? That rhythm Bilkul. that you can speak to the director's voice, and it can be a collaborative rhythm. Absolutely. So that a film that Anurag Kashyap cuts with Arti Bajaj or a film that Anurag Kashyap cuts with Shweta Venkat Matsu can look like two different films, True. feel like two different films. True. I have, in fact, read his other book. It's called In the Blink of an Blink Eye. Eye. Yeah. So, which is about editing, yeah. yes. And I am a big fan of that book as well. Yeah. But conversation just. Straddles so many things. It's like a life experience. Wow. So you can open any page, and you can put it down on any page, and you will still walk away from it a little shifted. Oh, nice. Because it's about many things. It's literally conversation. It's about many things. How nice! But this was amazing, uh, Dev. Thank you so much for all the recommendations. I hope you have also enjoyed these recommendations. I have also enjoyed them. Like I said, one or two times, I was also figuring it out as I was talking, and I had huh. discovered something about. my relationship with this work hi if you like this video please subscribe to chalchitra talks but if you don't like this video because i'm not the most uh, interesting video guest still subscribe to chalchitra talks because there are lots of other interesting videos